Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Dave Zurich. I'm the interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Scranton. And I'm very excited to welcome you all this evening. This is one of those moments where, as a historian, being in a physical space that has a connection to the events you're talking about always gives such a profound sense of place. And so we all get to participate in that this evening, and it's really a wonderful opportunity. Um, and so we're thrilled to be able to host this event uh, in a nation story, a Scran story, a nation story here in courtroom three. And in a lot of ways, the story we're going to hear tonight, some of you know very well, some of you may be introduced to for the first time. In hearing the story of the 1902 anthracite strike, this event to me, more than anything else we're doing in this series, epitomizes the reality, the truth, that Scranton story is a nation story. Right? This moment, this strike, is that moment in history where everything really does come together right here in this place. And so it's really profound and, and very exciting. And I'm thrilled to be able to be a part of it and to have you here with us and to have our speakers here with us tonight to talk about this event and its connection to our nation's story. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who made this evening possible. First, I want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support of this larger project, not just tonight's event, but some of the events I'll mention again at the end. Um, but this whole project has been an ongoing event, a series of events that have been fantastic and given all of us an opportunity to understand Scranton stories, to participate, tell our own Scranton stories, and it's really been a wonderful project and we're thrilled to be a part of it and to have had this opportunity. Co-sponsors of this evening's event include the Lackawanna County Arts and Culture Department, the Lackawanna Historical Society, WVIA, and at the University of Scranton, the Office of Commu Community Relations, the Slattery Center for the Ignatian Humanities, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the History Department. We also want to offer special thanks to the Lackawanna County Court of Common Pleas and Judge Moyle for sharing courtroom three with us this evening. We have uh, two speakers with us tonight. We have Dr. Robert Walensky, who will be our keynote speaker, and Dr. Melissa Mead, who will offer a comment afterwards. Uh, Mayor Cognetti, who was on the program, apologizes that she can't be with us tonight. Uh, she had a last minute personal matter to attend to uh, and regrets that she can't be here. But with that, I'll introduce um, Dr. Walensky, then I'll come back and introduce Dr. Mead, and then we'll save a little bit of time uh, for comments from the audience at the end. This is really intended to be a discussion as much as it is an informative event. So we'll save about a half an hour at the end for questions and, and dialogue. Dr. Robert Walensky is an author and professor emeritus of sociology at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. And he's the adjunct professor of history at King's College uh, in Wilkesbury. His work on sort of the strike and Northeast Pennsylvania and its coal culture is extensive. Uh, and what he's going to share with us tonight is a real sort of, not just accounting of the event, but a sort of cross section and a cultural explanation of its connection both to the area and to the nation as a whole. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Walensky to speak. Um, great to be here. Great to be back in the home turf. I was born and raised in the Wyoming Valley. Um, been spending a lot of time up here over the last 50 years studying anthracite. And um, uh, the O2 strike you know, looms large, very large in the history of anthracite. So it's my pleasure to be here to talk about it. I'm not the world's greatest expert on it, I want to warn you. I know there are some folks in the audience who know as much about it as I, but I, I have studied it, and any anthracite um, scholar can't help but, but know about this really important strike, the hearings of which took place in this very room. Now, the last time I was in this room was in, two, um, was in 2002. We had a play in here, a play um, on the hearings on the strike of 02. And uh, I, it was, uh, a, a packed house, I think they did it a few times, but it was on the anniversary of the hearings. So here we are back again, right around the same time, 20 years later, to do a 20-year retrospective and evaluation. Now we'll see if we can do this. There we are. 
My job is to talk about two things. Some of the better known facts about the strike and some of the lesser known facts, which I think are just as important. The better ones, the better known facts, you can, you, can, you can read a lot of places, but the lesser known, you can't. And then we're gonna talk about the meaning of this strike for the region, for the country, as was mentioned, and um, its implications. Here we are, November 17th, 1902 in this room. These are the commissioners up front, appointed by the president, Teddy Roosevelt. This strike was so important, it was the first time the president of the United States really got involved in helping settle the strike, and he had an even-handed approach. Presidents had gotten a little bit involved in the past, typically on the side of the owners, but uh, not this time. Here's our region. Um, start at the top, um, my, um, my laser is not working. Upper left, that's the anthracite region of Pennsylvania, the way upper left. The next one down are the three, anth the three anthracite fields, four subregions, northern, middle, there's two in the middle, and southern, we're in the northern. And then there's the northern, uh, and the one on the right. That's our area right here, Susquehanna, Wayne, Lackawanna, Luzerne counties. That was the most productive region, the most productive. Uh, the southern region was, but after 1850, the north just had so many coal mines and, 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 and such a, a, a productive capacity that the, that the northern field became the dominant field. This is the story of anthracite <laughs> in Five seconds, boom and bust. It begins in 1814, the graph does. The coal starts to pick up in the 20s, peaks right around World War I. 1917 is the most productive year, only over, sorry, not only, over 100 million tons of anthracite produced in 1917, and, and then there's ups and downs ups and downs. Um, you can see the, um, you know, the one down, big down is the strike of 02. Um, there's a couple downs, usually strikes. And it, this ends in 94. Uh, we're still producing anthracite. There still are a few mines operating, mainly down below, as we say, not in this county. I don't know there may be a dog hole in this county that I don't know about, an illegal mine. But, but, but there, there are mines operating down in, 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 in Schuylkill and uh, I think carbon. 1950, the whole region, the entire coal region had uh, 72,000 plus employees. And then down we go, down we go, down we go. 1970, over, just over 6,000. We once held here in Northeastern PA, 95% of this hemisphere's hard coal, the best coal, the best coal in the world. Pure carbon, smokeless, ships loved it in World War II. Bituminous, you could see them coming, you could see these ships coming, but not the anthracite ships. Uh, and this, these 10 counties are where it is. This is the mother load in this hemisphere. It was the first coal. Bituminous, central PA, Pittsburgh area, yeah, Western PA, but most of it further west. We have bituminous in 35 states, but you have anthracite only here. We're the heart of it. It was known in the 1700s, because the Indians knew about it too. It was the primary fuel of the American Industrial Revolution, which was, which was titanic. We don't appreciate the Industrial Revolution as we, as we should. Um, after the 1830s and 40s. Here's the Industrial Revolution on my wrist. Time becomes money. Before the Industrial Revolution, you weren't from up, sun up to sun down. Sun down. That's, you know what time it was. Nobody had a watch. Then you got to punch in, punch out. Changes everything. 
And you know some of the structures, I'm, I, I'm very sorry to say that they're all gone. Great, great tragedy of American history is that we tore down over 300 breakers just in the northern field. Last one was the Huber, as you may know, in Ashley. Oh, by the way, the, um, the uh, PCA, uh, PACC is the Pennsylvania Coal Company, about whom I've written a couple of books. Uh, this is their, this is their um, breaker in Dunmore, the number five. And that's the National Canal Museum Archives. That's their photo in Easton. And you've seen some of these, of the famous Breaker Boy pictures, photos. This is by Lewis Hine from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I might add a little known fact about Lewis Hine. A, a, a photographer for the Anti-Child Labor League. This is done at the Ewan Colliery in um, Inkerman, Pittston, that area. This is the Westmoreland, where my family worked in Swerville for a while. Notice the different shapes of all these breakers. This is a very old one, you know, it's wooden. They start to become metal in the 20th century, 1920s, 30s. Forest City, Pennsylvania Coal Company. Oh, the uh, previous one was the Lehigh Valley Coal Company. LVCC is the Lehigh Valley Coal Company. There's Forest City. Some basic facts about the anthracite strike of, of 02. There were many previous strikes. There were a lot of strikes between 1848 and, uh, and, 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 and uh, in 1902. But this was really the major one. It was the first strike where the federal government you know, did not take the employer's side, like as they did in Pullman in Chicago in 1894. Send in the troops to get those strikers out of here. Send in the army. Uh, the outcome was not predetermined. Teddy Roosevelt was very even-handed. In fact, he didn't like some of the coal owners. I'll talk about one of them he didn't like at all. The United Mine Workers of America, UMWA, the United Mine Workers of America, had a successful strike here in 1900, had a big one in 1899 in Nanticoke. They got a 10% raise in 1900, but there were a lot of unresolved issues. I'll mention one in a minute. And the workers were still angry. They were, they were not happy. So they wanted to strike again in 1902. John Mitchell, who we'll talk about, the mine leader, he didn't want to strike, but the men did. There's a very militant labor force up here in, in coal. Other facts. Mitchell becomes president in 1898 of the UMWA. And his famous phrase, the coal you dig isn't Slavish. I think he meant Slavic. Slavic coal, Polish coal, or Irish coal, it's coal. So we had 26 different ethnic groups up here, including African-American miners. And um, they often fought. They often battled. So he tried to bring them together, because you had to have solidarity to have a successful union. Well, the key actors, I mentioned Roosevelt, Bishop Hoban, who we'll come back to, of the Diocese of Scranton, Monsignor Father John Curran, later Monsignor John Curran, a priest in this diocese. Mary Harris, Mother Jones, the famous Mother Jones, who Teddy Roosevelt called the most dangerous woman in America. <laughs> Labor organizer for the UMWA. John Fahey, union organizer. And several local unionizers, like, like Mr. Gongleski from Swerville, who was a family friend, um, who went around in 1902 and 1900, mobilizing the guys and saying, come on, we got to." Pull together. And of course, George Bayer, B-A-E-R, that's a misprint. And the king of the hill, J.P. Morgan, who by 1904 owned everything. Ultimately owned it, because he bought the anthracite railroads. 
Lehigh Valley Railroad, DL and W, all the railroads, the Reading, Jersey Central, but all the major railroads, and they own the coal companies. They own the major coal companies. He was a great monopolist, J.P. Morgan. Come, I'll say more about him later. Uh, the commission was appointed by Teddy Roosevelt, met in this room, starting in the fall of 02. Uh, three months, they also met in Philly and Washington, D.C. They interviewed 558 witnesses, including 240 for the striking miners and 153 for the non-union mine workers, because not everybody wanted to join the union. And 154 for the operators, the owners, and um, even, uh, even 11 were called by the commission themselves, and they were eminent people who sat up here judges and, and commissioners of government. One was called a sociologist, uh, which was, I thought, the last time sociology had any prominence in United States history. Um, and afterwards, they appointed, the, they appointed the Anthracite Board of Conciliation to negotiate all future grievances after this strike was settled. Three owners were elected to it, three union men were elected to it, and they had an umpire Okay? And they did help settle a lot of things. You've heard of the coal and iron police. They were, they were infamous. They were here. They were involved in a lot of brutality, lots of protests. So uh, it was the end of the coal and iron police. After this, the PA state police were formed in the wake of this strike. Although the, although the coal and iron police lasted until 1931. But they were they were brutal. Here he is, J.P. Morgan, man who put together AT&T, put together U.S. Steel, a great monopolist, put together the anthracite monopoly. He didn't believe in competition, he believed in monopoly. Nothing like those monopoly profits. No competition. So he was a, the richest man the richest man, one of the richest men in the world. We we're not sure about the exact data back then, but he was really, really wealthy. We still have J.P. Morgan Bank, right? John Mitchell, president, dressed like a priest, no accident, because most of the mine workers by this point were Catholic. The picture would be on the wall right next to the Holy Family in a lot of Catholic families. You saw, you see this monument out front? If you came in this door, you didn't see it. It's on that side of the building. It's kind of a pilgrimage site for people who are organized labor people. There's Mother Jones, lived to be 100. Lost her children in, a, in an epidemic in 1870, went on to become a, a labor organizer. And there's George Bayer. Uh, president of the Reading. That's his picture in 1900. He was famous, for, infamous for two quotes, claiming that God had given the coal owners property, mineral rights, and power so that they could oversee the coal industry. And what they were doing was kind of like divine right. You've heard of the divine right of kings to rule, you know? Well, I guess God changed her mind somewhere around the American Revolution. And uh, kings do no longer had a right to rule. We're gonna elect our leaders. And so they're, they're out the window goes, uh, <clears throat> those are the divine right of kings to rule and queens. And, uh, but he thought the owners had the divine right and his second one was, they, they, one of the commissioners asked him about the mine workers, and he said, these men don't suffer. It's not too arduous down there. Well, half of them don't even speak English. There's a good non sequitur for you. They can't experience overwork and pain because they don't speak English. Okay. Um, the, the press took him to task. There's a cartoon in the Chicago paper. You know, he's, he's getting a whack by the public. He was not the most popular man in the country. And there is the famous divine right letter, which he had typed up 
and sent to a miner who wrote to him, trying to correct him during the strike. One of the mine workers, Clarence Darrow, we found his picture up here in this, in this, uh, this was from, this is a period picture, this is from the hearings right here, this picture in the front. And uh, famous for a lot of things, including the monkey trials. But um, he was a great orator, Clarence Darrow. What did they get? A 10% wage increase, reduction of hours from 10 to 9. The strike commission appointed uh, to, you know, to hear their grievances. Um, and, and, and they got national publicity. You ought to read those, those transcripts. I mean, there's some harrowing, harrowing stories in those transcripts. And the ABC is appointed, as I say. And the UMWA was recognized as a force in the industry, but the owners would not recognize its legitimacy as a representative of the miners. They didn't get that till the 20s. Lesser known facts. Those are the main known facts. Latimer Massacre is a precursor. This is the 125th anniversary of the Latimer Massacre. Um, it's coming up. 19 unarmed strikers shot in the Hazleton area at Latimer. Um, they were overwhelmingly Slavic. The Avondale disaster of 1869 was mainly a Welsh disaster. The, um, the twin shaft was mainly an Irish disaster. It depends upon who was working here at the time. Um, but um, this was mainly Slavic. Who are the Slavs? Poles, um, Russians, Ukrainians, Slovenians, not Lithuanians, not Hungarians. They're not Slavic, uh, from the Slavic tribes, but they came about the same time. It's a language difference and a cultural difference. Um, the, the UMWA came here in the mid-1890s and they mobilized the guys down at Latimer and there was a big strike down there and the county sheriff uh, it got out of hand and the, and the sheriff's deputy, uh, a posse, fired, killing 19. And that really mobilized the mine workers all over the region and really gave a shot in the arm to the UMWA. A lot of bad conditions. They were boiling over, low pay, dictatorial management, favoritism, company towns, company stores. You know the story. Unknown. A less, less known fact, number two, the immigrants were vital to the strike of O2, vital. The coal owners after the Civil War wanted to get rid of these radical Welshmen and Scots and Irish and German, these union guys. We're going to go over Europe and bring over a bunch of peasants who don't know what a labor union is. And they're going to be Slavic and they're going to be Italian and they're going to be Hungarian and Lithuanian. And they did. They paid agents to bring those people over here and paid their way and found them a job, gave them a place to live. It was all about controlling the labor force. And that's not enough appreciated, I think. The immigrants were resented at first by the existing labor force. Um, but Victor Green, who wrote a famous book called The Slavic Community on Strike, analyzes this. He attributes the success of the O2 strike to the Slavic community because the Germans and the Poles and so forth, uh, the Germans and the Welsh and the, and the Brits, let's call them Brits, and the Irish were Brits then, by the way, until 1922. Um, they, um, they educated these new immigrants. Immigrants were very interested in labor unions by 1902. And they were the majority of the workforce, the immigrants, and they stuck to the strike. I interviewed Victor Green before he died. He was at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And he said, I should have included Hungarians and Lithuanians, who I say are not Slavs, and the Italians, because they were solid. They were solid too. They were the new immigrants. It was the new immigrants who made this strike a success. Very militant by 1860, mainly thanks to the existing workforce, who were, who were not the newcomers. Okay? 
the British and the German, other Northern European, Dutch, there were other ones here, French. But these guys converted the new guys, and the new guys did it, they became avid unionists. And this area has been very pro-union because of that. I think it's been fading lately, but that's the history. Little known fact, number three, the Catholic Church. The majority of the workforce in 1902 was Catholic, I mentioned that earlier. All these immigrants, virtually every one that I mentioned, all those ethnic groups, Catholic. I mean, they, not all of them, but the, but the great majority of those in those groups were Catholic. The working class comes about in the Industrial Revolution. Again, in this country after 1820 and 30, in Britain, really in the late 1700s. Britain is the first country to industrialize. Steam engines and coal and all that stuff. Um, and and the, the, the revolution created a huge working class. This is the beginning of the industrial working class. And there were gross inequalities, industrialization and capitalism, they grow up together. Capitalism, free markets. Before capitalism, you had mercantilism as the main economic system. And the, the crown controlled mercantilism, it was a shipping system. Trade, based upon trade and crafts. And the, the crown got a cut of the mercantile trade. And that cut was called a royalty, a term we still use. Well, the revolution of industry changes all that. Now it's free enterprise, now it's entrepreneurialism. Now it's get government out of the way. The government used to run mercantilism. And uh, in the Catholic Church, they were worried that they were losing this new working class in factories, shipping, and coal mines. So Pope Leo XIII, he wants to do something. He writes an encyclical called Rerum Novarum in 1891. Um, it means, it means um, you know, of, of, of new things, but it's really about the condition of the working class. He wanted a third way between capitalism and socialism. He was afraid of socialism, but he thought capitalism would be very exploitive, gross inequalities, corruption, monopoly. Nothing like those monopoly profits. You know, you squeeze your competitors out. So he, he, uh, he affirmed workers' rights to fair wages and living conditions and the right to organize. Because the, the owners are organizing. Workers should be able to organize so they could mobilize for rights and benefits. But there'll be no socialist or communist affiliation. Totally against this atheistic ideology, communism. Socialism is not the same as communism, but he didn't see any difference. They're not, they're not the same thing. When you and I own Chrysler and General Motors, the American government, that is, in, uh, you know, with the last big strike, the, uh, the Bush II economic Wall Street collapse in 2007 and 8, we had to save GM and Chrysler by buying all their stock. Obama becomes the head of GM and Chrysler and of many other companies, that's socialism. When the government owns the businesses, that's socialism. But the Pope doesn't know the difference between socialism and communism. Communism is China and, you know, and Cuba. That's a different, it's, that's political. Socialism is economic system. Moving along. Um, he wrote about miners. Those who work in mines and quarries and take coal and stone and metals from the bowels of the earth should have shorter hours in proportion as their labor is more severe and trying to their health. So now the church is getting involved in workplace policies like ours. And governments did too, with, with 48 hour work week, 40 hour work week by law, but much later. Hoban of this diocese, he gets involved, he appoints Kern as his envoy to the strike. A Kern participates in many of the negotiations. He sat in these seats, he testified. Uh, he creates good friendships with Roosevelt. He's in Roosevelt's autobiography quite extensively. He visited him at his estate. <clears throat> and he's good friends with John Mitchell. In fact, he converts Mitchell, he helps convert Mitchell to Catholicism. Mitchell, you may know, is buried in, uh, is it um, Cathedral. Cathedral Cemetery? 
here in, in Scranton, and he dies a Catholic. Of course, his wife was Catholic. But uh, Curran baptizes him and buries him. I think from the, from the, uh, from, from the diocese cathedral. Yeah. Um, he becomes a labor priest for the next 36 years in all kinds of strikes and shutdowns on behalf of the UMWA, the labor priests. Roosevelt on the left, Bishop Hoban in the middle, and John Mitchell on the right. I don't know where this picture is, is taken, but um, they were good buddies in 1905. There's Curran in 1930 with a picture of TR on his desk in Wilkes-Barre when he's pastor of St. Mary's Church. Finally, number four, little known. That's the Catholic Church. The subcontracting and leasing system, you may never have heard of them. But the big guys decided to, to subcontract their minds to individual entrepreneurs. So rather than have the miners work for them, one miner and typically one or two laborers, that was the work culture. Brought it over from Britain mainly. Britain really shaped this industry, technologically and socially. Um, so this Joe here, he, he wants, a, he wants a, have a contract to take this vein of coal. He's going to hire 20 laborers. He's going to push them. And he's going to fire. He, he's the only guy that can fire the dynamite. Fire, 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 fire. These guys just, they're mucking. They're mucking that coal into the car. It's called mucking. And they're going to speed this up. And the miners didn't like it. Didn't like it. You don't think that Apple makes, you know, your, your cell phone or, or your computer, right? That's subcontracted to a company called Foxconn. They've got a big, big plant in Wisconsin. Nike doesn't make its shoes. They subcontract. Subcontracting is a very common way to make things, okay? And uh, now they're going to mine the coal. And at the same time, they're going to control the labor force. The subcontractors, you know, you're not going to work for me? Goodbye. We're going to blackball you. Push, push, push. And miners, certified miners, can't work in the, you know, in the mines because we're moving all towards subcontractors, becoming, you know, entrepreneurs and laborers. So either, either you've got to work as an entrepreneur, as a, if you're a certified miner with mining papers, or you've got to work as a laborer for a much lower rate. De-skill the workforce. An old trick. So, they fought that. And that was on, that was a number one demand in 1900 and 1902. The leasing system is where we're going to lease whole sections of mines to an incorporated company, often led by a former subcontractor. Guys like Louis Pignotti, you may have heard of Louis Pignotti, owned several coal companies, eventually bought them, began as a subcontractor, became a leaseholder from Lehigh Valley Coal Company, and when Lehigh Valley decided to say goodbye, he bought their mines. He bought them, including where my father worked at the Harry E in Swearville. So that was the progression. And Louis pushed his men, paid lower rates, often violated the union rates, but gave him a turkey at, at Christmas. Well known for turkeys. So, and the leases must pay a, a, a per ton royalty in an annual rental fee. And the, and the big guy says, yeah, go ahead, you, you take this whole mine over here. Take this whole section of the mine. Now labor's your problem. One of the most fractious labor forces in the nation is here. And now, and then of course organized crime gets involved as subcontractors and leaseholders. That's another story. They're opposed. They're opposed. It violated the work culture, as I say, de-skilled. And its elimination was the first demand in every labor negotiation between 1900 and the 1930s. But they could never get rid of it. The, the, the owners wouldn't negotiate that. And the courts probably wouldn't uphold it because you should be able to contract your property to whomever you want. So I call these subcontracting leasing tenancy systems because you're, these guys are tenants. They're renters, basically. 
And uh, they did raise productivity. We have the data. They did discipline labor. Threats, murders, beatings, decapitations. They enhanced management control in line with the thinking of F.W. Taylor, who was an efficiency engineer who was involved with efficiency. And, but there were lots of disasters, lots of accidents, lots of health costs, unsafe mining, and lots of labor resistance, lots of strikes. <coughs> All ethnic groups opposed it, the tenancy systems. The great majority were adam adamantly opposed to this. They wanted one miner to be with maybe two laborers, maybe three at the most. But they didn't want this subcontracting thing. The Italians were among the most active protesters. They had seen this system in the sulfur mines of Sicily where most of them came from. The Italians came here as skilled miners. Many from this new group, um, the Poles did too, there were a lot of skilled miners in Poland, but not in Slovenia and, and not in you know, uh, um, uh, other places in, uh, of the new, the new groups that came in, uh, parts of Russia. They were peasants. Um, but the Italians were skilled, and they came to this area. They mostly worked in Dunmore and in Pittston, the Italians did, for the Pennsylvania Coal Company, which is where I meet them. <coughs> they were beaten down by the mob, the mafia, in Sicily, who were subcontractors to the landowners with the church or the nobles. They owned the land. They subcontracted or leased the sulfur mines to organized crime. And the Sicilians were certain it was not going to happen here. Okay. But violence and death came with it. A topic that Bill Hasty and I wrote about in our book, Anthracite Labor Wars. Subtitle, Tenancy, Italians, and Organized Crime in the Northern Coal Field. Right here in River City, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Pittston. 2013. The Knox Coal Company was owned by organized crime, leased from the Pennsylvania Coal Company. They leased the River Slope mine, the mineral rights. Mined illegally on the Susquehanna River, playing fast and loose. Any workers protested, <laughs> there was, it was hell to pay. The best thing that could happen is if you get fired, the worst thing, you get beat up or, or killed. There were m many murders in the pit scenario, which we document in that book. And um, yeah, the leasing system leads to this. So the, what are the lesser known factors? The Latimer massacre, the immigrants, the role of the Catholic Church, and the subcontracting and leasing of mineral rights. Okay, Part of our history. Implications, well, keep in mind that it occurred in the middle, I'm going to be very brief here, middle of the Industrial Revolution. Factories and steamships and the class system and global immigration, labor moving all over the world, demand this new economic system called industrialization and capitalism. Cities grow. This area, spectacular growth in this area. And another conclusion was that organized laborers were making a statement. We're going to participate. We want to get some of this fantastic wealth that's being generated. We want to spread it around. How? Through organized labor. No other way. No owner is going to give you a fair share of the proceeds out of the goodness of their heart. You know why? The stockholders won't let them. The stockholders want returns, and they want returns this quarter. We don't even care about next quarter. We want returns right now. That's how the capitalist systems work, system works. That's why only the government could do something like build the Hoover Dam. The market, capitalism, won't build the Hoover Dam. Why not? Okay, we're going to sell stock in the Hoover Dam. Uh, it's going to be 100 bucks a share. 100 bucks, thank you. Here's a piece of paper called a share. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're going to start making money on the Hoover Dam in 10 years. It's going to take us that long to build it and for it to be profitable. Ten years, you want to hold my hundred dollars before I get anything back? Sorry, I want returns this quarter. 
I'm re I'll be retired. I'll be dead in 10 years. Only government can do that because it doesn't need to re worry about returns, right? That's why you super highway system and so forth and so on. Um, the U.S. now have, we have about the lowest unionization of any country now. We're down now to about 6% of the private sector, 12, 15% of the public sector for a total of about 10%. Iceland is the most unionized country at 91%. The average in Europe is about 50% which is the most unionized continent, Europe. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's about it. Yeah, good, I had, I had a picture of, um, of, the, of the marker out front for the O2 strike, but it's way down the bottom and I don't think we need to do it. So with that, I will say thank you, and we're looking forward to Melissa's comments and for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Walensky. Um, our next speaker offering comment on Dr. Walensky's remarks uh, is Dr. Melissa Mead, who is a visiting assistant professor of communication at Allegheny College and the founder of the Anthracite Coal Region of Northeastern Pennsylvania Digital Project, which is a public digital humanities forum. Uh, and she will offer a comment now as a follow up, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So, Dr. Mead. Thank you. Um, so I am, a, I'll start by saying that I'm an ethnographer, so I don't focus specifically on the strike, but I've done my, my research on the anthracite region. Um, I'm from here, and um, both of my grandfathers are miners. My mom is here in the audience. She's a coal miner's daughter. Um, so I, spo I, focus on, I focus on the lived experiences of, of what, people's, what people experience living here in the anthracite region. So with that, that's what you're gonna hear more about here instead of, you know, and, and how the legacy of the strike, perhaps um, a little bit of that. So I'm gonna start with a quote from Samuel Gompers, who was the first and longest serving president of the AFL-CIO, um, which, which is the AFL, um, some of you may know that, and he, he was asked what was the most important single incident in the American labor movement in the United States, and he replied that it was the strike of the anthracite miners in Pennsylvania. From then on, he said, the miners became not merely human machines to produce coal, but men and citizens. So the strike for him was evidence of the effectiveness of trade unions. And I, I dug up some, I love these stereo photos. This is the strike commission, and um, I, got, I got another one of these stereo photographs. They're made in, in Meadville, where I'm, where I'm living now, um, a lot of them. And so the 1902 anthracite strike, as, as Bob was pointing out, sets a precedent for the federal government to intervene in problems of public interest. So President Theodore Roosevelt, um, in, in, this, in this room, but beyond that, he's thinking that um, ignoring the needs of the coal miners at the time, they, they were the essential workers, the, what we are thinking of, of the essential workers right now. And this represents a fracturing of the social contract, right? And so he has this, he, he has his eyes on the, the immediate needs of the public though, what, what they were calling at the time a coal famine. Um, and so he, he's thinking about that and he's thinking about the social contract of the time. But perhaps he did not anticipate um, the long-term impact of King Coal, what we sometimes call as King Coal here in that greater anthracite region. And so that's some, some of what I study. Um, so you saw a similar map. Um, and we know that from what we heard that anthracite, and you may know that it reached its height at World War I. So that's soon after what Rose, the, the negotiations that Roosevelt were, were making. And then it gradually declined. So we get fuels like oil and natural gas. They're becoming, they're becoming more popular. And there's an increase again in um, anthracite use during World War II. 
And then it, it virtually collapses in the 1950s, of course, with the Knox Mine disaster and the flooding of the network of mines. And the cities up here by the 1960s, Scranton and Wilkes-Barre, um, they, they were the only two urban areas that we had, I believe, in the US. They had unemployment rates in the double digits. So those are some, some, some of the backdrop there. Now me, I'm talking about my own field work. I've been working um, in this area for um, 10 years, besides living here as, as a child and growing up here, participating in events, interviewing people. And I've also been running this page for over 10, about 10 years. And this page, so to give you a sense, um, and so I want to talk about three points here, if we, if we have time. One is the long-term impact of the industry. If we have time, place-based identities. If not, I'll skip that. But the other thing I will touch on is connections to the current national labor relations. Climate. So the first one that I'm, I'm going to touch on is something that I identified in my research called environmental classism. Um, so, so thinking of this, uh, I know we've had other industries in the area, but thinking about as coal, of coal as, as the dominant industry here, I draw on my years of participant observation and, and digital work with the community, and I define environmental classism as a memory and place-based experience that includes long-term exposure to the fallout of deindustrialization. So open pits, Acid mine drainage, ADM, as you may know it as, disposal of toxic waste and other pollutants. And so this is an image from my dad's hometown, a woman who was featured in a documentary who's working on some environmental work. She gives this, gives this to me. She was in the documentary. And um, she's talking about um, coal ash that leaches into, into water there, into the ground water that there's in, in different areas around her home, how there are no liners to stop it. And so I, I, I get to talk to the different filmmakers there, and um, she's, she's speaking more about that with me as well. And um, she's, she's telling me that they put 16 million tons of fly ash in this particular pit, and, and you can see the pie right there, and there was no liner. And so the overall investigation in the documentary was focusing on that, um, and, and, and there are known carcinogens in there. Um, and so going into more of this detail, of many other, other residents talk about these same experiences. On my project, we're photographing at St. Nicholas, and these are some photographs from a resident. And this just went, I would almost call it viral. They were just photographing it in, incessantly. And this, this particular resident here, they, they're different people, but this is a comment from one resident in photographs taken by another. This resident is highlighting the, the, his reaction to it, the reclamation of the silt banks for the power plants, the fly ash there, um, and, and he, critiquing critiquing the way it had been treated. Of course, we know a lot of the, the mining companies were declared bankruptcy and left these things here. Now we know there's reclamation, and that's a good thing. And um, as, as we may know, fly ash has toxic chemicals in it, and people highlight it also in some of the events I attended. Poly Polysema vera, a rare blood cancer that's involved in in the area, um, at least in the southern, the more southern fields. Um, so this, this is, environmental classism is a kind of environmental inequality that has um, been a long-term experience for the residents of the coal region. And um, it's a social process that includes a lot of actors, residents, the state, coal companies, workers, former workers, um, social organizations. Um, I'm going to skip the point about identity and talk a little bit about the current labor market, um, the relationship with labor. So I don't know if you know this, but right now in Alabama, the biggest labor story in the country is happening. Um, and I know that's a bituminous field, but um, it's getting very little attention. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, there's about 900 coal miners that walked off their job in April of 
April of 2021. And they haven't been back to work since. This is an AP photo that I have. This is Warrior Met Call. And so I want to draw our attention to it in a comparative sense because there's some fascinating parallels with the anthracite coal strike of 1902. So although the United Mine Workers didn't get their, their union officially recognized during the 1902 strike, John Mitchell was able to negotiate with the president for the miners on behalf of them to get wa higher wages and a shorter working day. But these days, the miners are taking home decent wages. And even though the coal, coal is in decline and it would have been used for steel and steel is in decline, the miners received what would be considered a middle class wage with the developments of the United Mine Workers. But the mine company started to face financial problems and declared bankruptcy and laid workers off. So what happens down there is it rehires them under a new company name and but with cuts in their benefits, right? So if things aren't so good in the new company structure and the benefits for the mine, that the mine workers were promised, um, they never come along, right? And what's more is they were working under safe, unsafe conditions with this skeleton crew. So um, a little bit of you know, the connection of government and unions, Democrats and unions used to go hand in hand, but with climate change as an issue, the mine workers sort of felt cast aside. So going back to the election a few years ago, kind of Donald Trump jumps on this moment and he claims that he's going to put the miners back to work and he makes big promises. So the miners believe him. But coal's not going, doing so well under the Trump administration. And so back in Alabama, mine workers go on strike, 2021. And what happens is fascinating because the Trump supporting Republican senator, Tommy Tuberville, he goes and he, he supports the mine company, <laughs> and so does the Republican governor. And um, they did the opposite with what the party platform was. And then the Republican judges, they put, they put injunctions on the miners. But so, so this sounds like, oh, then, then maybe the Democrats will jump in. But they didn't. And um, they didn't. And even though it was a golden opportunity, but what happens 30 miles away is there's an Amazon warehouse, um, just like there is here in Scranton. I think you have one kind of near, right? It's in Bessemer, Alabama. So it's 30 miles away from the mine. And um, the warehouse was about to vote in order to become the company's first unionized warehouse. So spoiler, they don't, they don't unionize. But what happens is they send this congressional delegation down there and it holds a press conference, and un almost unheard of, President Biden weighs in. Um, you know, except for maybe the case of the 1902 strike. The so um, the president warns the company essentially, I mean, he doesn't say directly, but he says, hey, you know, quote, it's your right, not that of an employer, it's your right. No employer can take that right away, so make your voice heard. Um, so, what I want to offer is that the anthracite coal strike, 1902, is the first crisis and the first president who kind of behaves like a 21st century president or even like maybe a 20th century, late 20th century president. And in this sense, kind of Roosevelt's presidency feels you know, modern. Um, he kind of uses the Oval Office and the, pre the power of presidency, I would say, and the, the bully pulpit, the, the influence that we, we ask nowadays, and you know, kind of demand the president to use. So, so here we are, kind of asking, I'm asking, I suppose, why did, the, why did the president direct his speech towards Amazon workers and maybe not towards the striking miners? I don't know. Um, and, and we expect the president to sort of to participate in all things, and I think that maybe started with a 1902 strike. So that's my... Thank you. With that, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, we have a microphone that's going around, so maybe if you want to raise your hand, and we'll have the microphone come over to you, and that way you're picked up by the cameras as well as by the rest of the audience. Could you address a... Wow, that's <laughs> Wow. I'll, I'll try again. Can you address 
uh, to some extent, the economic uh, hardship put on the nation by the 1902 strike. Like, how bad was it in the sense where we, I assume, anthracite coal was fueling most of that economy at that time, where we, in fact, kind of running out of coal, anthracite coal, if we were, were there other alternatives? Or, and I guess I'm looking for, was, was this really a way to really kind of tie President Roosevelt's hands? Did he have to act? Did he have to do something to get that coal flowing again? Yeah, uh, the coal, M Melissa mentioned, mentioned the, was it the coal, the winter, what was the term? The coal famine, yeah. The coal famine. Yeah. The coal famine, sorry. And uh, the, the worry was, you know, New York City, the East Coast was very dependent on hard coal for home heating especially. Hard coal had lost markets after the Civil War in, in, in steel production and in a lot, in, in a railroad, steam engine, um, to bituminous, much cheaper bituminous. It's much cheaper to mine. And there's lots more of it. This is the only anthracite there is. I mean, if you want more anthracite, you've got to dig down. It's more expensive. I mean, seven, eight, nine veins, 10 veins, whatever you have in your area, and the more you go down, the more expensive it is. Whereas bituminous, well, you know, maybe we're gonna find some new stuff in West Virginia or Ohio or Illinois or Iowa or, or, you know, or Alabama. So you, know, you can find it in more toward the surface. And now the biggest coal producing state being Wyoming, which by the way, named after the victims of the Wyoming massacre, another not enough appreciated thing right here in Northeastern PA. Um, uh, it's, it's strip mine, it's all gouges. There's, there's no deep mining in Wyoming, it's all surface mine, horrible environmental consequences. But that's the biggest coal producing state. Um, so Roosevelt's worried about the famine. It has political repercussions for him. So he feels, feels the need to act. There are alternatives like bituminous, but it's, it, it's, it's not that plentiful. It's further out, it's further away. And uh, you gotta re retool your furnace, you know, to, to burn soft coal if you're burning hard coal. So for a lot of reasons, he really felt the stakes were high for him personally and politically. Don't forget, he became president because, because he was vice president and the president died just the year before. So he was not elected and he wanted to run again. And so he had to watch, you know, watch his P's and Q's, as we say, for the 1904 election. Do you want to add to that at all? Um, you know, it, it, it also, it was a, I would add, and, you know, something interesting that you wouldn't see happening today. Perhaps it, you know, it has a lot to do with the, the timing. You know, the wars hadn't happened yet. But he even thought of nationalizing, you know, the mines. So that was another um, perspective that he at least considered when he, when he was weighing his options. So that's how strongly he you know, felt about this. On the subject of subcontracting, can you define what a certified miner is? Sure. What's a certified miner? Uh, it's a person who I kind of indicated has mining papers. You've heard of miners have mining papers. You have to go through a, a process, and in 1889, it was required, the Pennsylvania State Legislature, legislature wrote a law, the governor signed it, that a miner, to have the title miner, as opposed to say mine worker, to have the title, the skilled title of miner, you have to be certified. And you have to go through you know, the tests and training and uh, an apprenticeship, basically, and then you get you get your mining papers. It's a document. My, oh my, I remember my grandfather's mining papers. Now, my father was a laborer before World War II. Laborers are unskilled, okay? They, they're not certified. Certified by the state of Pennsylvania now, okay? Uh, but my father worked in the Harry E. Breaker after the war, and breaker workers were mine workers, okay? I mean, and, and so were, there, so were the, the, the people who worked around the colliery uh, and, and there were, you know, guys who worked, you know, with, 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 um, with, with make sure the railroad cars came in and they would get, get the coal dumped. They were mine workers. Mine worker is a generic term. Miner 
is a skilled designation. So, and a lot of people are very, of course, very proud of their mine, mine papers, mining papers. It was, it was often you graduated. You know, you started as a nipper in the mines, you know, and then you're the door tender, mule tender, and you become a laborer, and then get certified as a miner. And there's even two more levels now. You can become a subcontractor. And if you're really entrepreneurial, if you have the backing, you become a leaseholder. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're doing it. Sorry. Okay, sir. You're good. Thank you. My apologies. I'm a coal miner's daughter, so I have to ask a question. Um, you had mentioned that the coal breakers were no longer around, but there was an operating mine in Carbon County. Does that still, does that have a coal breaker there that's still operating? Or if not, how do they, I guess they break coal in there. I guess that's why it's called a coal breaker. So um, is it more advanced down there in Carbon County as um, being that they're still mining coal there? I'm not sure. Um, I, b I believe that there, that there was Sue Hand, who you may know, Sue Hand is the famous artist of our area's breakers. Um, in fact, I think she has an exhibit right now. No, that's Richard Healy. Who, does she have an exhibit at the Anthracite Museum right now, Sue Hand? Yes, she does. About Lackawanna County breakers. She, she paints them, and they're just gorgeous. And she's done Luzerne County, and she's done Lackawanna, and there's one up now at the Anthracite Heritage Museum. Um, but I recall getting a call from Sue Han the, the two years ago about this very subject. And I think we concluded that there's, that there's some quasi-breaker there. It's like a shell of a, of, a, of a facility in which they, you know, the breaker does, it breaks the coal. The coal comes in in all kinds of shapes and clumps with rock. And, and, um, and, and um, they have to process it, clean it, Separated into different sizes, you know, different sizes, and that's what the breaker does. Okay. And and so I think there's one quasi breaker down there that does this. But do we have someone over here, Michael? Yeah, there's. It's not an old breaker, but the when the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company reformed, um, it's, I don't think they call themselves the LCNN anymore. But there is an operational mine on the outskirts of Tamak when they do have, I guess, a modern breaker. I don't know what the capacity is or what the, what, you know, what the mechanism is. But there is a breaker for the company that's there now. I, I think, is there also a breaker now that I think about it in Jetto, Pignati? I, I think there's one down. But when I say, I meant the classic breakers, you know, the, the ones that were built late 1800s and maybe the first half of the, of the 1900s. Some of these, there's one, I think Popple has one down in Duryea that you wouldn't think it's a breaker. It's got corrugated metal on the side, it's square. It, you, it has, the, you know, I think it just have, one, have two stories. So I, that's probably, I think, what's down there. The, the last uh, quasi-breaking operation I physically laid eyes on was about 20 years ago. I don't know how much of an actual structure was there, but they were breaking coal in a town called Triverton near Shimokan, huh. way down south. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill, Bill Best, do you have any ideas about that, Bill? Yeah, uh, initially the breaker was a job classification, and what they would do is break uh, coal over uh, grates, and whatever came through was sized those of us who are from the anthracite region know that we need sized coal because of the forced air needed to be pushed through the, uh, the coal to make it burn. It has to be heated evenly for it to start uh, in, into combustion. Um, one of the biggest um, <clears throat> things, mistakes, is um, it, it, there's a few washeries around, and they look like coal breakers. And the difference between a breaker and a washery is a breaker is made to remove the impurities from coal, the coal being the majority, and it necess necessary to have it crushed and then sized, as Bob mentioned. And then the washery is the opposite. It's to reclaim the comb. And what they do is, is the uh, comb is the majority, and the, um, you know, the lesser part of it is, is the coal. And that's uh, usually done with cones. And uh, 
uh, magnetite, um, a floating liquid. Uh, those, um, so I could go on with, with all the, the different things about keep up breakers, and I'd be glad to talk to anybody afterwards as well. And I do have a question before we're done with the... Uh, and, and Bill's working to restore the mine, uh, the tour mine in the park in Scranton. Right. With the underground miners, we're on uh, um, on the internet underground or undergroundminers.com, and uh, it's the Brooks Mine. And we're also going to be having a display uh, this this winter in the Everhart Museum. So please stop by and see the mine. We should be open. Um, the mine itself should be Good. open for touring. Good. Hopefully um, by spring of 2023. So. You're welcome. Good. When, when Bill's not surfing in California, he's a miner. <laughs> no, it's really good. What good work they're doing in in Nayog Park at Everton. Yeah, Everhart. Hi. Um, I just want to start with one statement, and then I have a question. I know that uh, my ancestors and all your ancestors. Uh, actually built this nation because out of this area with the anthracite coal and the iron production and the furnaces down here and the railroads and the canals, we built this nation, but we suffered like how Dr. Mead was talking environmentally and, you know, uh, health-wise and stuff. So, you know, we should feel more pride in our ancestors in this area because I don't I don't know, I think it's kind of lacking. And then, um, Dr. Walensky, uh, I picked up a book one time during Anthracite Month called Demon Sea, no, Mind Sea, not Demons. And uh, it was, spoke of, uh, I think it was after the 1902 strike about uh, in Hyde Park, there was a demonstration and the mine owner called in the state militia to break it up and there was a number of people killed during that demonstration by the state militia, the Pennsylvania state militia, but I never hear much mention of this. Do you have any other information on that? I, I do not know about it. Uh, there could have been the coal and iron police. It could have been the coal and iron police because they were around. The coal and iron police, here's how they worked. The state <clears throat> would, would um, sort of lease them <laughs> to the coal operators. And the coal operators would have supervision over the coal and iron police, or the iron operators, okay? So the state would say, okay, you can have them now and you do what you want. And of course, they're gonna, they're gonna re reinforce the will of the, of the owners. And there was great protest over this, especially among the mine workers. And that's why we formed this Pennsylvania State Police right after about 05. And then by 31, the coal and iron police were, were just disbanded. But do we have a, a, some knowledge over here about the, uh, about the Hyde Park strike? Yeah, a little bit. He's an old Hyde Park boy. Uh, there is an excellent book called uh, Wales in America, subtitled The Welsh in Scranton by a gentleman named Bill Jones, university professor in Cardiff, Wales. He's well known to a number of people in the room here. He has a couple of pages devoted to uh, militia activities against the Welsh miners in Hyde Park uh, late in the, uh, I guess, the 19th century. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, wasn't contemporary history, but it, it was about the 19th century, and that might be the incidents uh, that are being referred to by this lady back here. Of course, Hyde Park was a oh, Welsh neighborhood. Uh, it was, uh, uh, Scranton was the Welsh capital of America in the second half of the, uh, of the 19th century. This, there's a, this, this was a big, because of the Welsh miners. Uh, the Welsh had, the Wales, Wales had tremendous mining uh, regions, especially in the, in the south, in the Rhondda Valley, and they came over here, and that's why I say the Avondale disaster of 1869, um, of those 110 victims, 69 were Welsh, and they're buried right here at the Washburn Street Cemetery, Washburn Street Cemetery. But I don't know about one after 1902, I'm sorry to say, but maybe Bill Jones, we can put you in touch with Professor Bill Jones, who has been in, here several times in his book, The Welsh of Scranton. Maybe he knows about this post-02 situation in Hyde Park.
Could one of you talk briefly about how these miners and their families survived without income through this period? Where did they, they didn't save up and then take the money out from under their mattresses. They, they had to get it from somewhere. Well, the mine owners were baffled. They, you know, can you eat air? They couldn't believe that these miners could survive. They wanted to starve them out. They wanted to starve them out. Five months strike. Um, and, and, and you know, and the twenty, the twenty-two strike was long, and the and the twenty-five strike was long. Uh, th th that was actually long, <coughs> longer than the O2 strike. We became famous for long strikes which helped do the industry in, by the way, because we were seen as a very unreliable fuel. However, um, these, they were immigrants, they were peasants, they knew how to stretch a dollar, they had pigs and chickens and, and goats, they always had a garden, they knew how to can, you, you, you know these things, they knew how to can goods, they always had vegetables, Pick huckleberries. I got in my oral histories. I have stories about the kids being sent out to pick huckleberries, and then they'd, they'd either go door to door and sell them for like a nickel a, a basket, or they and or they can them. So they 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 just knew how to do this, and it did have self help societies. Each ethnic group had its own society, and uh, they often bought stuff in bulk, so you could you know get a train load of something come in or or, or several you know, carloads of stuff come in, and, and, the, and they would be at a much cheaper price. But uh, they, they did it. I mean, they would not let themselves be starved out. But there are people who went very hungry, that's for sure. I'll, I'll add, too. Sure. We, we, should, we should also remember that um, 1901 and 1902, about half of these, you know, as we know, were, were immigrants and um, from Eastern Europe, and they had been brought here to mine the coal, and they were creating a condition where there was surplus labor. So um, many of them were not working full-time. They were promised to work full-time. So this was a part of the striking conditions, right? And so, and the other part of that is that um, others were working too much. So th these were part of the problems that they were, they were complaining about. And they were complaining about low wages, and they hadn't had they hadn't had raises in, in decades, right? So um, they were, of course, very interested in, in joining a union. And, and I believe, it didn't though some of them go back to, to Europe too? Oh, yeah. A lot of them went back to, to um, their home countries. So that is, despite what we, we typically know, that might be one of your lesser known things, is that a lot of them went back to where they, uh, you know, their home countries. So um, despite some of the other more, you know, survival-oriented things that they were doing, yeah. They were survivors. And I think we, you know, we talk about the cultural influences today. Uh, I mean, I, I think that the people in this region are survivors. We've been through a lot up here. Deindustrialization, the loss of all the industries, not just anthracite. I mentioned garments. But uh, this, you know, this region is a, uh, we, we know how to stretch a dollar. We know how to get by. Uh, it's, it's a cultural trait. And show me any mining community, by the way, and you'll find the same thing. Maybe one last question. Um, right there in the back. Uh, can you talk about, I did arrive just a little bit late when we were showing the chart about the textile industry and the coal industry. Um, you know, and perhaps you said this in the I apologize. Um, What's the connection between the coal mining and the textiles? Well, it's really <clears throat> more garment yeah. than it is textile, my, my graph. But uh, as mining went down, garment making went up. Um, and that program next week is, is about this. And, and again, that flyer is outside, part of this wonderful, wonderful series that, that the folks in this area, University of Scranton and other other actors, Lackawanna Historical Society and so forth, have put together for this community, uh, funded by the NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities, and other, other sources. But um, the shops that came in, the garment shops that came into Northeastern PA came from New York, the garment capital of the country. And they came here for one reason, labor costs. 
the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, ILGWU, had organized almost all of New York. It was founded in 1900 in New York, and it had organized New York, and uh, there were no garment unions out here. So we're gonna, they came here starting in the 30s, and they lasted for about 10 or 15 years before the ILGWU organizer, organizers followed them. And among the most prominent is Min Matheson, who uh, will be mentioned next week prominently in, in the show, in the program next week. But uh, by, by 1950, 1955, this, the garment workers around here were about 80 to 90 percent unionized in the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. And, but the garment industry was here, costs were still lower, labor costs were still lower here, rent was lower here. Uh, you know, land, labor, and capital. You know, those three things, and you'd often, get a, you'd often get a grant from the local government to bring you in, or, or give you less tax for opening up a garment factory. So we had a lot of garment workers around here. I know the Wyoming Valley, in, 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 when Min Matheson left in 1963, Wyoming Valley had about 13,000 garment workers, 90% of them women. There were men, men were the cutters typically, but mainly, but they were mostly women, and, um, and still cheaper than Manhattan. Still cheaper than Manhattan. And I would add, I would add, footnote, among the local garment shop owners were the same guys who leased coal mines from the big coal companies. The same mobsters. That's right. They, they laundered their ill-begotten funds. They laundered their illegally from gambling and prostitution and whatever. They laundered their money in two directions, garment ownership and coal mining. Well, with that, we'll, uh, we'll thank our speakers again, so thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for participating in this and have a good evening.